Amen. So as part three today, uh, we're in a series. It's like I said, it's called Living With Yourself Here. Three Habits to Safeguard Your Soul. And the, the, the purpose of this is taking care of your soul. And last week we talked about this idea. I, you know, I talked about, okay, what is a soul actually? Well, you know, what do we actually call a soul? And, and I talked about how it's this, it's the inanimate thing that's in you. It's the immaterial thing. It, it's the, the spirit or the essence of who you are. It's also the only thing that is eternal. So when you go and you pass away, you take nothing with you. But your soul, it continues to go somewhere. And, and when I looked at, at world religion, and I looked at cultures all around the world, everybody has the same concept because they've all modeled it, I believe, off of Jesus. It's, it's like the, the truth will always make itself known even when people don't realize they're finding it. They're accidentally finding it. Everybody has the idea that when you die, when you pass away, your soul can either go to a good place or it can go to a bad place. But wherever that place is, it's an eternal place. And so when we look at how do we safeguard our soul, what exactly does it mean to safeguard my soul? That what it means to me is to, is to make an effort to protect the one eternal thing about me. So if I believe that my soul is eternal, and if I believe that it's going to go on after I am no longer here, then I can't think of a better place to leave it than with the only other eternal thing that I know, which is God. So if I want to give my eternal to the eternal creator, then what do I need to do to safeguard my soul so that I'm able to do that? And today is the, is the last step in that. It's the, the last part in that. Part one was surrender our will. We talked about how we can't do things very well on our own, can't manage our own bank account, tie our shoes right, we can't get to church on time, we can't, you know, we can't do any of that stuff on our own, let alone take care of our own soul and make our own decisions about our soul. So we kind of surrender our will daily and we give it to God. And then it was last week we talked about maintaining your heart, which was, hey, do you have envy? Do you have jealousy? Do you have greed? Do you have anger in your heart? like those four really good checkpoints to see, is there something that's not healthy or not good in my heart here? And then today, we're going to kind of tie it all together, but I'll ask you guys a question first here while I get a few things set up. Do, who here loves to win? Who, who loves winning? Who's competitive? If, 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 if my, in my family, we have, uh, Casey is not competitive at all. And then I'm only competitive if I know that I'm going to win at it. <laughs> right? Right? Um, forgive me while I unwrap a, a cable here. I'm only competitive if I know that I can win at it. I remember growing up, anybody have the game called Trouble? Was that in South Africa, Trouble, where you push the thing? You pu uh, it's like a dome, and you push it, and it pops um, dice. Well, anyway, I remember my mom beating me at that game, and me just like screaming so mad at that, thinking, why can't I win at this thing? Um, but there's, there's a large part of us that, that we really, really like to be good. We want to be good at something. And we want to know that we're good at something. And some of us are really good at things because you were naturally born with it. Some of you woke up this morning and you just got ready and you showed up and you just look great just because you're good at looking good, right? Right? And then there's like the rest of us, you know, who, you know, in the morning when I wake up and I pray over the sink and I say, Lord, let this be holy water as I baptize myself in it. Please renew me so that people don't throw up. You know, it's, it's, are we, are we naturally gifted at that or, or not? It's, it could be sports. You know, when I look at rugby players, we were in, um, in Durbanville yesterday, Rhonda Bosch was playing, Letha was playing, and you've got some of these boys that are just huge. They've got full beards, uh, you know, right? Some of them have like a beard. And you're like, this kid is 16 years old. There's genetically something very different there. You know, when, when I was 16, I had to use the steps to get out of a swimming pool. I couldn't pick myself up off the side. And then these guys at 16, these rugby players are built like houses. You know, so there, there's things that you're good at because you had the, the you know, the genetic advantage and then there's things that you're good at because you really, really put a lot of effort into becoming good at those things. You decided, you know what, I'm going to make myself better 
in this way or in this element, and you put time and time and time into it, and you became really good at it. And so the question that we ask is, why does it feel so good to be good? Why is this something that feels so good to us to know that we're good? Because that that drives a lot of why we do the things that we do. And the reason that this feels so good is there's two words. And these aren't bad words, but they can be bad words. But, But it feels so good to be good because we get approval. And we end up getting appraisal from this. These things here, this affirmation... How much of, of your, how many of your issues, and I know you've got a ton, come because somebody didn't affirm you enough when you were growing up and when you were a child? You know, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot of us. See, uh, approval and affirmation, this is something that fuels a, a lot of what we do. You know, w- when we hear the words like, hey, you know, you're looking pretty good, you know, like uh, what's, what's awesome is you're not on a diet. But you didn't drink a lot of water the day before, and maybe you cut out uh, one of your liters of Coke Zero, and so you come to work the next day, and someone says, hey, you're looking like a little bit thinner. It was because you're not bloated, you know? And you're like, oh, hey, thanks, man. I, I may accidentally start a diet because I've gotten a little bit of, of approval. I've gotten a little bit of affirmation that I'm looking kind of good. I'm looking better, so maybe I should actually start to do something with myself here. You know, or, or if, we, if we do things... That, that don't get approval, don't get the, this affirmation, then you know, we oftentimes find ourselves where we, we don't want to keep doing those things. The, the thing that I want you to start thinking about for today's message specifically is this, this truth, this concept. And I want you to open yourself up to self-examination here. And, it, and it's this, how much of what I do do I do because of some idea of approval or affirmation in my life? How much of my personality was guided by the pursuit of approval and affirmation? How much did I go into a sport or did I not go into a sport because I didn't get the approval or the affirmation? I mean, the, the, the kids that grow up in these, especially these all boys schools, it's, they, they fight tooth and nail for these things. And, and they do it at the cost of each other. And that can really, you know, raise up an environment where, where kids are super strong and they're super secure in themselves. And that can also kind of create kids in this environment where they don't believe in themselves for absolutely anything. And so that, that brings us kind of to, to the danger. There is a danger in this. You know, it, it's, it's okay to want approval and affirmation. I love when Casey gives me approval or affirmation. And she says, man, you did so good here. Man, that was so great the way that you, you know, took care of the kids. Or, you know, and it's like, man, I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better husband. See, see this, this healthy version of approval and affirmation, it draws me to want to do the thing that is good and healthy and continue to do it more and continue to do it better. But the negative side of it is that it puts us in a, in a really sort of negative cycle. And three things happen when we start to negatively seek out approval and then affirmation from people. So the, these three things are, are here. Josh is going to put, you, put them up for us. So that it's a very dangerous cycle, okay? The first thing that happens is we become really accustomed to it. So now, so now it's, okay, I'm, I'm used to getting approval. I'm used to this, this affirmation. It feels good. I know that I'm going to get it. I'm going to come in. I mean, th- think about me. Uh, up here, standing in front of you every Sunday morning, every single bit of who I am, every single Sunday wants to step off this stage and have one person tell me, you didn't screw it up, great job. And that's how deep that desire for approval and affirmation is, but that's not healthy. That comes from a place of insecurity, that comes from a place of pride, it's not healthy. And so I have healthy people that that give me feedback on the message. And I value their feedback, and it's constructive, and it's good. And then when I go home, my wife, she gives me healthy feedback, and, and she, she, she pours into me and kind of re- helps replenish the part of my spirit and my soul that I poured out on a Sunday morning. But the negative side to this is if I, if I were to get so accustomed to it that then all of a sudden one day it's not there, that sends me into a bit of a tailspin or into a panic. Now, another example I thought about here was was you're in a relationship. I don't know if anyone here deals with, you know, overwhelming levels of anxiety like I do. If you're part of the anxiety club, raise your hand, you know, if you, so 
All, everyone with anxiety just went, you know. Um, you know, they're sitting on their hands now. So, yeah. So, so if you're if you're like me though, you microanalyze everyone's everything. So you you have microanalyzed the sound of your significant other when they say hello on the telephone, and if it's just barely off, then, hey, what's going on? What's wrong? Is everything okay? And they're like, yeah, it's fine, you know. And you're like, ah, I don't think you're fine. And they've not said or done it. All they've said was hello. Or, you know, when you're getting off the phone, if you say, okay, hey, love you, and the other person just hangs up, you know, <laughs> great, you're going to spend the next eight hours doubting your entire existence, <laughs> right? That's fun. You know, whereas the person on the other end of the line, you know, maybe they just drove through a tunnel or they got cut off or whatever, you know, they ate buttered popcorn and the phone fell out of their hand, it hung up, no big deal. And they think, hey, he knows I love him. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to call him back, you know. But we're accustomed to it to the point that when we don't get it, it sends us into a tailspin. And then the next step to this is that we feel so entitled to it. Look at what I'm doing to earn this. You know, I, I, I give so much of my life to this person. How could they not affirm me or approve of what I'm doing? How, how on earth could he disagree with the way that I keep the state of our house when he's at work all day and I'm home with, you know, three kids? You know, it, it, it's this, all of a sudden, we, we become very entitled. I should get your approval. I should get your affirmation. Because I've become accustomed to it. And now I just feel like you owe me. That I deserve it. And then the last step is we become very dependent on it. See, becoming entitled, that's a, that, that, that's a dangerous state of our heart. When you get to a place where you feel like you're entitled to someone's approval, how, or, or if you feel like, how dare you criticize me? If someone criticizes you in a meeting at work or in your family, the way that you do something, criticizes your driving or how you park your car or which parking spot you use or don't use, and, and you feel kind of something flare up in you and you think, well, wait, what are you doing here? Leave me alone. I know how to do this. You may need to check and see if you're entitled to something. And then are you dependent on it? So what happens if it's just removed altogether? Is it like pulling somebody off of an, uh, an extremely addictive drug where it immediately puts them into just a crazy withdrawal, where it just puts them into a place of, of really, really kind of unhealthy, almost like you're going to get sick? If you come out of that relationship that you're in, can you see yourself living a healthy life? Or do you stay in the relationship that you're in, the bad relationship, because... You can't even see yourself not in that relationship anymore. You can't even imagine yourself in a healthy place because you've become so absolutely dependent on it. And see, that, that, that's kind of what we're talking about today. And the way that we are going to handle this is we're going to handle this through, through a posture. All right. So the, the, the third habit that we're talking about today is open your hands. And I, I want to look at this like a posture. You know, when my hands are open, there's not a lot, and, and this is going to make more sense as we go on through the message today, but when my hands are open, it's a, it's a posture. I have open hands. I can only catch. I can only receive. I can't really hold on to. I can't, I can't, I can't throw. I can't manipulate. I can't tear. I can't pack. I can't fold. I can't stuff it into a pocket. I can't do anything. I just really can only receive and hold and catch. And that's a posture that we can actually position our hands in. And when we position our hands in it, a lot of times our heart will then follow. So we're going to learn to do that today. And we're going to learn to do that in probably my favorite way. We're going to contrast two people. There's two people in the Bible, amazing people, both of them, absolutely incredible. One of them is a teacher's pet. It's a goody two-shoe. It's the one that does everything right. We're going to do him first. We're going to get through him super quick because nobody identifies with that. You know, when they, you know, uh, even as I was studying for this, I thought, you know, this guy, you know, thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay thought that was funny. I did, I did too. But the other one, the second one we're going to talk about, I'm like, yeah, this is the one that I really identify with. This is the real world kind of standard that we can relate to. But the first person that we're going to talk about is a guy named John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, for those of you that, that don't know, 
Uh, this is not John the Baptist who had become the disciple of Jesus. This is John the Baptist. He was born around the same time as Jesus. In fact, John's mother, Elizabeth, knew Mary. They were, they were related. And so when, when Mary had her baby, Elizabeth, who was married to Zechariah, they didn't think they could get pregnant either. It's like both these families, neither one of them thought that they were going to have a baby. Mary, you know, that was a very specific situation, immaculate conception, whereas Zechariah and Elizabeth are just really old and they haven't been able to have a child. And then God comes to them, an angel comes to them and says, you're going to have one and he's going to make a way for the Savior. And, and, and John is born. And as John grows up, he grows up kind of uh, a little bit like an extremist. He wears camel hair clothing and he eats honey and locusts for food. And he's a bit kind of out there with his ideas. But John serves one purpose and one purpose only. And he walks in that purpose extremely confidently. He doesn't waver from this thing at all. So let, let's look at what this purpose is. We look here, turn to our first bit of scripture here. And it says this, John the Baptist, in verse 4, this is Mark 1. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That is, he's requiring a change of one's old way of thinking, turning away from sin and seeking God. So here's what, John's, here's, what, here's what this is saying. Why did I choose this verse here? I chose this verse because it says that he appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of forgiveness. John just shows up. And, and in this wilderness, there's a huge body of water. And, and John shows up in the wilderness. It's not that he went to Jerusalem. He didn't go into the city center and, and build himself a, a, a tent or a booth and say, hey, baptisms come this way. He just shows up in the wilderness around a body of water and he just starts talking about this guy that's going to end up coming. And John's like, hey, I'm here to make a way for him. But he's preaching. So he's telling people, you guys need to repent for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, this is something that people, they would understand because they went to the temple, they offered a sacrifice, and when they did that, they were forgiven for their sins. They were made clean. And now there's a weird guy in the desert who says that, I mean, this is like the wish dot com version of forgiveness. Okay, there's the real version, which is expensive. It's at the temple. You have to go and you have to go there. You have to put your sacrifice down. You have to make sure that you're clean and you're pure and all of these things. And then there's John's version, which is, hey, uh, if you can't afford the temple, go out into the desert. There's kind of a crazy guy, face is covered in honey. He's got bugs in his pocket, wears camel hair, and he's, he'll forgive you. He'll dunk you, and you'll come up clean with your sins forgiven. That, 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 that's John's version. Now, I would think that that would lead to a place where no one was there, and that John would stay on his own, telling, you know, screaming at the wilderness to repent and turn from one way of life and turn to a new way of life. But that's actually not what happens. If we look at the next verse that I've got here for us, John then, after he appears and he's preaching the gospel, he then goes to, I'm going to pull it up here. So in verse 5, and all the country of Judea. So why did I choose this here? I want you to understand how significant it was what John is doing. John is so good at this. He is so talented, so anointed, and so good at what he's doing because it says all the country of Judea, all the people of Jerusalem were continually going out to him. So what that means is you have hundreds of thousands of people leaving the temple, leaving Jerusalem, going out to the wilderness and finding John. Now, John was not promoting Facebook ads. He did not have Instagram he was not paying for Google AdSense. He did not have printed signs like we've got on the back walls. John had none of that. The only thing that John had, no YouTube channel, no TikTok. The only thing that John had was this truth that he was proclaiming. That truth was so profound. And he was doing it so well. He was so good at it. So good at telling this truth that all... The people of Jerusalem were continually back and forth, back and forth. They were going out to him and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. We're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of people walking away from the temple system of sacrifice for cleanliness. 
going to a man in the wilderness and being dunked in a pool and being brought up and accepting the forgiveness that they've been given. This is, this is unbelievable. And I want you to know and see how this shouldn't happen. This absolutely should not make sense. And so then we skip forward in, in, in John 1 verse 29. We see that John, he's out there, he's baptizing people. We're skipping you know, way forward in his story. And, and he looks up. And remember, John was made with one purpose and one purpose only. And this purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus. And John looks up and he says, look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is walking towards John. And as Jesus is walking towards him, John, is, he, he ends up saying, I can't even be your servant. How can I baptize you? And Jesus says, you just got to do this, man. This is part of who you are. And when John baptizes him, Jesus comes up and doves fly. And it's this beautiful moment. The Holy Spirit just descends down on Jesus. John has done this thing that only he could do. That he is incredibly, incredibly talented and gifted to do. And so actually after this happens here, you know, Jesus has now been baptized. And then we, we continue on in the story. And in verse 35 of this, something very interesting happens. So John, later on, and there's a big body of water. So he's baptizing people still. And now he's standing with two of his disciples. And what you need to know about disciples, they're extremely loyal to be a disciple of somebody means that you are sold out, loyal to that person. You do not waver. You don't jump ship and go to another person. You're loyal almost to the death for that person. And so John is there standing with two of his disciples, his loyal followers. And John looks at Jesus as he walks along. And he says, look, there's the Lamb of God. He's back. There's that guy again walking along here. And when he says that, Two of his disciples heard him, and so they go off, and they follow Jesus. So now John has lost two disciples. Now, if you're insecure about anything, and your friends leave you, and they go hang out with another friend, all of a sudden, they're not playing rugby or soccer with you on break at school. Now they're playing something else with other people at school. Or if, 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 if at work, all of a sudden... You know, they're not hanging out with you at lunch. They're hanging out with somebody else. Or if you're in the dating world, I mean, praise the Lord. I am not dating right now, and I don't have to date. Oh, my word. I just want to thank God again for that. <laughs> yeah. The idea that you're talking to somebody, and you're, you know, you're putting the work in, and then all of a sudden, you know, you introduce them like, to a friend, and now they're, like, hanging out. At, like, you know, it's, yeah, this would just be... So hard. So John's got every reason in the world to be insecure here. He's just lost two loyal disciples. These are not guys that were just sort of like hanging on the edge of John's coat. These are guys that, that went with him, that, that, that spent time with him, that prayed with him, that studied under him, that gave their life to following him. Are you starting to see the significance of what happened here? Is that two of them just, boom, they up and they go. And that actually stirs up a, a little bit of controversy, not only with, with John, but, but look at it in verse 25. Look at what happens with the local priests right here. So therefore, there arose a controversy between John's disciples and a Jew in regard to purification, ceremonially washing. We talked about this a little bit last week. Everybody's upset about how to purify and how to wash your hands, especially back then. How, how are we clean? How are we not clean? And so there, there's this controversy that rises there. And, and then it goes on in the next verse. And it, and it says, so they ended up, they, they came to John and they said to John, Rabbi, the man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan. So they're saying, remember a couple days ago, that guy that when he walked down to the river, you said, hey, look, there's the Messiah. That guy, when he was with you, to whom you testified to look at him. Well, did you know that he is also baptizing? And guess what? Everybody is going to him. And the idea was like, John, how can you be okay with letting Jesus become the baptizer? You're John the baptizer. You're good at this. But it looks like Jesus is better at this. Now, this is the point where John had, had every reason to be insecure and upset. He had every reason to, to resent Jesus. 
And it's his disciples that are coming to him, telling him, hey, this other guy's baptizing people. Should we go do something about it? Should we go jump this guy? Should we bury him? Should we drown him? What should we do about this guy that he's becoming Jesus the baptizer? John gives this amazing answer here in verse 27. John answered and he said, I don't have the emotional maturity to have given this answer. I'll just be upfront with you. John answers and he says, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. See, what John is, is displaying in this statement here is this posture, open hands. And because John is displaying a posture of open hands, John is walking in freedom, he's walking in peace, and he's walking in contentment. See, when his disciples are following another disciple, when somebody else is turning out to be better than him because he's, he's baptizing more people, you know, and John would end up losing his head for Jesus eventually. John's story doesn't lead to a, an amazing place of him living to be a very old person. John ends up being beheaded. But John never left this posture. And because he never left this posture, there's verse after verse after verse. I just didn't have time to read it to you. Where John talks about how he prepared and took care of his soul. Because while John was always baptizing people, he was saying, there's going to be one that's greater than me that's coming. And when the greater one comes, I need to become less. And John says that over and over and over again. And that's what affords him to have this posture. So if you think, if we think that we can just choose to be this, it's very hard. But we have to think, what are some things that I can start doing every day? What are some things that I can start saying every day? And, and what, what are some things that align with my identity and my expectations that allow my hands to be like this? Because John's identity, John the, the baptizer, that was his identity for everyone looking in. But John's identity for himself, looking in on himself, was John the preparer. He was going to prepare the way. See, the thing that gets us into so much trouble, and, and this, is, this is the point, and I, I struggled with how to, how to bring this in without it just overtaking the entire sermon, are, are what we put our identity in and our expectations of how we hope that to play out in life, those impact our relationships with ourselves and others and with Jesus. Because that's what allows us to say things like, God, it's not fair. God, why is this person better than me at this? God, I'm disappointed because I was like this, and then now I'm ending up in a place where I'm you know, metaphorically being beheaded. You know, we walk around and we say, God, but my hands are like this. Why, why is it not working out for me? And that, that's expectations. That's what your identity is tied into. John had no expectations. His expectation was that he was a servant, not even good enough to be the servant of Jesus. And his identity was tied up in, I am the one that prepares the way, not I am the one that is the baptizer. And so that's, that's John the Baptist. That's what happens when you do it right. That's what happens when, when you do it and you, you get it right. And when you have this posture of open hands, nobody can take anything from you. Nobody can threaten you. Nobody can diminish you. Nobody can shake you in your confidence because your identity, your attitude, and your posture are all lining up. And that, that's a pretty great place to be. But, but again, I just want to tell you, I don't walk off stage here on a Sunday morning, and, and most pastors probably don't say things like this, and they would probably tell me, don't say this, Chris, but I don't walk here off stage thinking like, I'm free, I'm full of peace, and I'm absolutely content about what happened here on a Sunday morning. I walk off stage, when I walk out, I walk off stage, and I have to remind myself, Chris, turn your hands up. Remember, you don't have to be a great uh, leader or pastor for God to work. You know, God often reminds me, he said, Chris, I can draw water out of a rock. I do not need you in this position. You are here because I'm using you. You're a tool, a tool that I sent my son to die for, that I, that I love so much, but I don't actually need you. And that actually is the perfect place of freedom for me because that realigns my expectations, my identity, and everything. And that makes it so that I can walk around here and say, I'm so glad this thing doesn't rely on me and depend on me. We, you know, side note here, I surveyed 
over 100 churches to look at their service times. And too many churches, I don't want to give a number to it, but too many churches used to have two services and now have one. And we're a church that's moving in the opposite direction where we used to have one service and now we're having two. That's not because of me or because of Pastor Linton, or because of Trudy, or because of our incredible eldership and our finance team and and our HR team. It's not because of any of that stuff. It's because when God called Casey and I to Cape Town, I stood on top of Table Mountain and I looked down at at Cavendish Square. I looked down at the southern suburbs and and God said, I I want you and Casey to come and build a church here. And I looked down and I I saw a picture of God's hands just scooping people up and putting them into a church. And and I said, God, give me a word for this here. Give give me something to hold on to. And, And God said, Chris, just make something I'm happy with and I'll fill it for you. He's saying, Chris, get out of the way. You think you want to be good at this, but instead I want you to get really good at not being about you and just letting me do it. And so my purpose here on a Sunday morning during the week is I just want to build something God's happy with and then watch what God does with it. And so now I I want to skip on to the second guy here that we're going to talk about. And this is a guy, uh, I, I love him to death kind of created a few problems for a lot of people. This is a guy named Saul, King Saul. Now, King Saul, this is the one, just so you know, that does everything wrong. John the Baptist did everything right. King Saul does, does everything wrong. This is the one that we're all going to learn from. If you learn something from John the Baptist, well, then you're probably prideful. So, because you're more... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, my wife's not in here filtering me, so... Like our tech guys upstairs are like, move on, Chris. Don't say what you're thinking. So King Saul is uh, the first king of, of, of Israel. I- Israel, they had God. And then one day they said, we want a king. Everyone else has a king. And God said, but you have me. And they said, no, but everyone else has a king. We want a king. And so he said, okay, fine. I'll give you a king. And he appoints Saul. And this is how Saul becomes king. Saul's dad was Kish. And he had a son named Saul. And this is, this is what the Bible says about me. I mean, him here. The Bible says <laughs> this here. He says, he was a choice and handsome man. Okay, check, check. Among the sons of Israel, okay, maybe, there was not a man more handsome than he. So Saul was a good-looking, handsome guy. He stuck out among all the sons of Israel. And actually, from his shoulders and up, he was a head taller than any of the other people. So Saul was this beautiful man, handsome, he stuck out, his head was a, was a head taller than anybody else. He walked into a room and he owned it. He had that kind of aura about himself. Now, now Saul would then be told, there's a, a, the way that this comes about with him is that Saul's dad lost a bunch of donkeys. And Saul's dad said, Saul wants you and a servant to go find all these donkeys. And so Saul goes out and they're looking from tribe to tribe to tribe, trying to find these donkeys and they can't find them. So Saul says, we should go back home so that my dad, Kish, doesn't worry about us being gone. And the servant says, hey, I'll tell you what, there's a city over here and in the city, there's a a seer, S-E-E-R. So basically a, a, a priest or a prophet as we would think of today. There's a seer there that you can go talk to and you can ask him about the donkeys, and he'll tell us where those donkeys are. And Saul's like, well, I, what are we going to give him? We don't have any bread. Or we have hardtack to eat. We're out here just, we have nothing to give this guy. And the servant says, well, I've got a little sliver of a shekel of silver. We'll, we'll give that to him. Saul's like, okay, great. So they go into the city here. And, and this is where we pick up in, in the next verse that I've plucked out for you here in verse 14. So between 2 and 14, it's just about Saul trying to figure out how to get to this city. Then in verse 14, they went up into the city. Now as they came into the city, there was Samuel coming out toward them to go up to the high place. Samuel's important in this story. Samuel's the prophet. He's the one that God is talking to. So when Israel begged God for a king, God told Samuel. And he told Samuel only. And so Samuel, when it says he's going up to the high place, he's about to perform the highest of highest priestly duties. He's going to go up to a special place in the temple and he's going to break bread so that everyone else can break bread. And as Samuel is casually walking to go do the most spiritually important thing that could ever be done, he sees Saul 
And he actually invites Saul to come up and do it with him. And so the, the next verse that I've got for you here is now a day before Saul came. So this is setting up Samuel getting ready to meet Saul. So this is God going before Saul's arrival and prepping Samuel. So the day before he came, the Lord informed Samuel of this saying, Hey, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Benjamin is one of the 12 tribes. It was actually the smallest tribe. Uh, they, they kind of felt like they were the most insignificant, but great things come from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he's going to send a man from the land of Benjamin. You're going to anoint him as leader over my people of Israel. And then the next day, Saul shows up. Samuel picks him. And then he says that this guy, Saul, he's going to save my people from the hand of the Philistines. So this is the guy that's going to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. It's King Saul. And when Samuel saw Saul, it's a hard statement. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There is the man of whom I spoke to you. This is the one who shall rule over my people as their king. And so that, that, that's the story of, of Saul being picked and Saul being chosen there in that, in that situation. It's, Saul is prepared to go. The way has been, pre been prepared by God. And now Saul is made the king of Israel. And this becomes a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but it becomes a process. And eventually Saul becomes a great king. He is the first king of Israel. But it doesn't stay great. I, I wish for Saul's sake that it did, but it just it doesn't. Saul isn't able to keep it, uh, to keep it all together here. And the shameful thing here is as we watch Saul disintegrate in his leadership, Saul had been given approval from the king in order to become the king. So he'd been given something that we seek, approval and affirmation from the king of Jesus, from, from God, to become the king. But if we know the story, for those of you that have been around long enough, you know that Saul doesn't stay the king. So why is that? Remember, we talk about posture. The posture of, of John the Baptist was like this. The posture of Saul reminds me of my posture a lot of times. It's, it's this. It's clenched fists. See, Saul decided that he could not operate like this, that he had to operate like this. See, when, when we're losing out on something that we feel like gives us uh, approval, that we feel like affirms us, then what do we do? We try and do everything we can to get it back. That's that really bad cycle that we get stuck in. When you're dating somebody and he or she no longer tells you that they love you on the phone, immediately you're thinking, how do I get this back? What do I need to fix? What problem do I need to solve here? How do I get this love back? How do I rekindle this thing? And what do I need to hold on to? So then that's when you get a little bit jealous and uh, they tell you, you know, hey, I, you know, I can't come over tonight. I'm doing a homework. And you're like, I know you're with Brian. I know that you're cheating on me, and you just all of a sudden get from here to here, you know, at, at, at 160 kilometers an hour there. It's because you're clingy, you're grabbing, you've got clenched fists. You want to hold on to what you've been given, and you don't want to let it go, because if you let it go, you can't imagine what life is like without it. And that's where Saul was. And so Saul, with his clenched fists, he would end up having an encounter with David, this, this young guy who would end up becoming the king after him. And, and look at what, what happens with clenched fists and with David here. So you've got David and Goliath. So David is called down, Saul and his army. They're not able to, to beat Goliath. They're afraid of him. And there was a kind of an agreement that the Philistines would send a guy and that uh, the Israelites would send a guy. And whoever won that whole army would claim victory. And so no one wants to send anybody down to fight Goliath. David goes down. David fights Goliath. He kills Goliath, cuts his head off, you know, walks it around. David is absolutely the man. So out of that, as they were coming home, when David returned from killing the Philistine, which is quite interesting because remember Samuel said, hey, God said, you're going to lead the people to freedom from the Philistines, talking about Saul. But Saul wasn't doing his kingly duties. He wasn't on the battlefield. He was in his tent with fists clenched because he was afraid to lose everything that he had. And so David walks in and does it. And so as they do it, the women came out of their cities 
and, and uh, they came out of the cities of Israel. They're singing and they're dancing to meet Saul. And they've got tambourines and they're doing songs of joy and they've got musical instruments and it's a whole big celebration and they're going to meet Saul as he comes through. And then then look at the the song choice here. It's just brilliant. Nobody obviously pre-approved this song because look at the next verse here. And so they they bring their musical instruments out and then in in verse 7, it says that the women sang as they played and danced saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. You know, I... Have you ever tried so hard to be good at something and then somebody else just ends up naturally being better than you at it? Now, I want to tell you a story. You know, I I, I was never, I always wanted to be a runner uh, for a long time that I I, I was that um, until just years and years of injury. And I remember my first ever 5K that I trained for. I had a friend that went to boot camp um, in Paris Island to become a Marine. And he went to boot camp and he came back and he was like, super skinny. You know, they did push-ups and stuff until there wasn't anything left of those guys. And he comes back and he takes one look at me and, you know, this guy's been living the barracks life and saying, yes, sir, and all that stuff. And he looks at me and he's, you know, he says, Chris, you're a wreck. You're a mess. And actually, I was fine, by the way. (laughs) I wasn't like on drugs. I wasn't addicted to anything. I I was just like, okay, life was fine. And he's like, you're a mess, you're fat, you're unfit, you're, un- you're like, we're going we're gonna to shape you up. So he started, you know, like taking the dog for a walk. He started taking me on walks and then on runs. And it's like, we got to work this guy out. And I started to enjoy it. And then I got to where I really, really, really enjoyed it. And then I got faster and I got better and I really loved it. And I was running every single day. And I remember the day that I could outrun this guy. I remember we were going up a hill. And he's actually a, a pastor of a church in Tennessee. He's an amazing man. He's absolutely amazing man. And he says, you know, why are you running so fast? And I said, because I'm punishing you. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know. And um, so I, I trained for, for a, just a 5K race in Knoxville. They had one on, on, it's called the New Year's Day 5K. So it's January 1st. I figured if I had a good chance at any race, it was the day after New Year's Eve because most people would have been drunk or hung over. So I'm going to pick that race. So I go to that race and they were giving away a special prize. If you were in the top 75, and there was like 700 people that ran, then you got a, a, like a, a special prize for that. And I just wanted my name to be called in the top 75. So I trained and trained and trained and ran. And I, I ended up running, I don't remember exactly what time it was. It was around 19 minutes or something. But, but as, and it was, it was flat. There was no wind. It was just a kind of a perfect race to just cruise. And, and as I'm coming down and I can see the finish line, I just feel this wind next to me. And it's a 12-year-old girl. Yeah. Runners, right? Does that make you mad? Yeah. So it's too fast to trip. But she, she came running past me. And then her dad comes running past her and he's just chuckling, you know, like, oh, you know, she loves to run. And I'm like, you know, trying to breathe. She didn't train. She didn't do it. It's just what they did, you know. So... It, you know, it, it, it's frustrating when you work so hard and you feel so good about what you're good at and then somebody else comes up along beside you out of nowhere and they're just without even any effort into it, they're better than you. And that's what Saul is dealing with here. Saul, he, he was the king. And then people were saying, hey, you've slain your thousands, but David, David has slain his ten thousands. And Saul starts to get really, really, really jealous. And he starts to not be okay with handling his identity and his expectations. And he just keeps clenching those fists. And so look, look at what Saul does next here. Now, I've picked some verses that take us through the journey of, of Saul losing his mind. And Saul, he says, he becomes angry for this saying, he was very displeased. And he says, hey, they've told David that he'll have 10,000s of people ascribed to him. But to me, they've only given thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom, see, Saul is, he, remember me talking about you just go from zero to a hundred too fast? Saul's heard one song, and now he's already saying, well, David's just going to go ahead and take the kingdom. And then this story goes on as we continue to unfold this here in the next verse, in, in, uh, in verse 9 here, and it says, So Saul looked at David with suspicion and jealousy from that day forward. That relationship was changed forever. Now, let's look at... Saul tries to kill David. And it came upon Saul, and in verse 10, that on the next day there was an evil spirit from God that came over Saul forcefully, and he raved madly inside his house. Saul hurled a spear 
For he thought, I will pin David to the wall. I will kill him. He actually tried to kill him twice. David evaded him twice. And then now there's a very sad statement here that we look at. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but the Lord had departed from Saul. You know, that, that's a really lonely place to be. When, when you feel like God has departed from you, but, but this, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but he had departed from Saul. See, this fear here, I've got another statement here that, that is about fear. I want you to think, what's scarier, the open hand or the clenched fist? Who carried more fear? Was it John the Baptist with his open hand or was it Saul with his clenched fist? In fact, if we take that a step further, this is what I really want to encourage you with today. We should fear the consequences of closing our hands more than the consequences of losing what is in them. See, my my encouragement to you as we finish this message off today is, is is my hope was that a part of your identity and your expectations would kind of be rerouted by this posture of, you know what? I do want to have an open hand. And coming from somebody that is a a self, listen, I confess, I'm a fist clencher. That's me. Fear happens, fear comes, and you grab stuff and you hold on to it. I'm every bit of that. But also, because I'm a son of God, because I'm saved, because I've given my life to him, and because I'm forgiven, it doesn't take me hardly anything to change from this to this. And when I go from this to this, you know how much freedom I walk in? How much peace I walk in? And so quite simply for you guys, as we finish up safeguarding our soul, is how much peace do you have over your soul? How much freedom are you walking in? And are you walking with open hands or with clenched fists? And so I'm going to pray for us and just trust that God finishes this statement off for you. Heavenly.